Do you know how the Book of Knowledge defines them? As monstrosities. Your Honor, I ask you, are they monstrosities or are they human beings? Okay, just to catch you up. In 1908, the Dreamland Amusement Park on Coney Island opened a new attraction, Freak Street. A review of human oddities on display among the dark rides and gravity railroads. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of information about Freak Street itself, not even really lists of the performers who worked there. So since I can't showcase those individuals, I am instead delving into the histories of folks whose unusual bodies were displayed in sideshows in the 19th and early 20th century. Today, we'll be looking at Daisy and Violet Hilton, a pair of conjoined twins who were born the year that Freak Street opened, and who went on to become some of the most famous vaudeville entertainers of the 1920s and 30s. Oh, uh, before I forget, like and subscribe below and check out patreon.com slash tybannerman if you'd like to help support my work on this channel. So last episode I talked about the word freak and how it came to describe people with unusual bodies. But earlier than that, the word monster was used, going all the way back to the Roman Empire. Monster comes from the Latin monstrum, which meant abnormal shape and an omen of divine displeasure. By the 14th century, monster had evolved to mean almost exclusively a person or animal born with a deformity and, unfortunately, the old association with bad fortune carried over to those children who were born different. So perhaps it's no surprise that when Kate Skinner, an unmarried 21-year-old barmaid in Brighton, England, gave birth to a pair of twins who were joined at the base of their spines on February 5th, 1908, she was horrified, called them monsters, and refused to touch them, much less breastfeed them. Not a surprise, but tragic, ignorant, and reprehensible. Is it possible to find hope in a story that begins in such a hopeless place? That will, and uh, please consider this a content warning, take us through dark avenues of exploitation and misery. I say yes, and on this episode of Meet Me in Dreamland, I'm going to look at one of the saddest, cruelest, yet I argue ultimately hopeful tales that I've come across, the unexpectedly affirming lives of the Hilton sisters. No, not those Hilton sisters, I mean Violet and Daisy Hilton, Soon after their birth, a doctor assured Kate Skinner that the twins would almost certainly die soon, and she maintained her distance, leaving their care to the midwife who had assisted with the birth, a bar owner named Mary Hilton. The girls were connected via their buttocks and lower spinal cord, and as yet medical separation was unheard of, but they were in good health, strong and vivacious, and showed no signs of passing away. Although Kate Skinner declined to care for them, midwife Mary Hilton saw some advantages in their survival, mainly financial ones. So Mrs. Hilton offered Kate a large sum of money to essentially buy the girls from her, and Kate Skinner accepted. Hilton then brought the children to her bar, the Queen's Arms in Brighton. There they were kept in an upstairs room, and for the price of a few shillings, patrons could climb the stairs and witness the girls' unusual bodies, sometimes even going so far as to poke and prod the skin that attached them. Unfortunately, Mary Hilton was not an affectionate woman. Instead, she viewed the girls as little more than her property and a money-making investment. In Violet and Daisy's account of their childhoods, instead of motherly nurturing, they, at best, got lectures. There was a speech repeated to us daily, over and over again like a phonograph record. She never petted or kissed or even smiled. She just talked. Your mother gave you to me. You are not my children. Your mother gave you to me. The speech grew longer as we grew older. I'm not your mother. Your mother was afraid when you were born and gave you to me. When you were two weeks old, you must always do just as I say. And when we displeased her, she whipped our shoulders and backs with the buckle end of a wide belt. Don't go. Things get better for them, I promise. And then bad again. But honestly, it ends with hope. Just to balance the dreadfulness of that last section, here's a clip of a capybara and a dog kissing.
Isn't that better? As they grew older, Mary Hilton, whom the girls called Auntie, gave them lessons in violin and piano as well as dancing, to increase their earning potential, you see. And it worked. By 1911, Mary Hilton and the now musical sisters were touring the UK, then on to Germany and even Australia. The naturally talented and frankly adorable children caused a sensation wherever they went, but any potential happiness resulting from this growing fame was not to be. Mary Hilton continued to be despotic and distant and even worse, Mary's daughter Edith had accompanied the group on the tour and while they were performing in Australia, she met a man named Meyer Myers, a balloon salesman, and who could resist. Apparently, quite taken with a man who would provide her with free balloons whenever she wanted them, Edith allowed Myers to court her, and the two were soon married. Mary Hilton was getting older, and she suffered an infection to her legs, so she handed off much of the day-to-day -day business of running the show to Meyer Myers, who instructed the girls to call him Sir. Meyer Myers was just as cruel as Mary Hilton ever was, and the girls now lived in fear of both of them. As they entered their teenage years, they toured the U.S. and their marketing leaned more heavily on how attractive and innocent they were. Photo after photo shows them dressed as little girls well into their teens and engaged in normal tasks in their own inimitable style, boating, playing music, tennis, eating, dancing. Soon they even came to the attention of Bob Hope, who booked them on his vaudeville tour. Still, even as their photos showcased a carefree lifestyle, they were essentially kept under lock and key by Mary Hilton and Meyer Myers. But Mary's condition continued to worsen, and in Birmingham, Alabama in 1926, when the girls were just on the cusp of their 18th birthday, her old infection flared up again, and this time it took her life. The girls' feelings were decidedly mixed. Why cry? I asked Violet. We have hated her forever. I'm afraid without her, Violet answered. Now Sir will boss us. Let's run away, he whispered. And they tried. At Andy's funeral, while Edith Hilton was sobbing at her mother's casket, the girls began heading to the door, intending to make a break for it, while the entourage was distracted with grieving. Unfortunately, Meyer Myers quickly grabbed hold of Violet's arm and refused to let go. Still, they hoped that Mary's death would allow them to have some say in their destiny, but soon they were horrified to discover that Auntie's will had passed their guardianship on to the balloon seller and Edith Hilton. Meyer Myers moved the group to a San Antonio, Texas mansion. He had dreams of Sunday running a ranch. And began billing the girls as the San Antonio Siamese twins. If anything, Daisy and Violet found their freedom even more constrained, with Meyer Myers refusing to let them even sleep in their own room, much less have a moment of privacy. They still held out some hope that they would be freed once they became legal adults, but when their 18th birthday came, Meyer Myers revealed that he had secured their legal guardianship into adulthood due to their condition, and what's more, he threatened that if they ever disobeyed him or ran away, he would have them locked away in an institution where doctors would perform experiments on them. And all this time, their public image was one of carefree girlhood, two beautiful and talented performers who had taken the world by storm, despite their, quote, monstrous body. Now, I'd like to introduce a very special cameo in this story, Harry freaking Houdini. The girls don't describe this in their autobiography, but I think we can assume that he arrived in a sudden puff of smoke and lightning, probably escaping from a chained up trunk in the bottom of a well or something, but no matter how he arrived, he apparently met them while they shared touring dates. One night, when he ran into them backstage at a venue he and they were playing at, he gave them the following advice. Live in your minds, girls, he intoned. Probably. I mean, that's the sort of thing he'd do, right? Intone? Live in your minds, girls. That's your only hope of private lives. Recognize no handicap. And read all the newspapers you can. The sisters had not been permitted to read newspapers before this, but now they took care to sneak them whenever they could. In particular, they were enthralled by the scandalous court cases that were reported daily. And this, this was the tiny pebble that started the avalanche. Perhaps they thought they could somehow win their freedom through the courts. But of course, Meyer Myers was still not letting the girls out of his sight for a second, and it's not like they knew any attorneys. As the girls entered adulthood, they became, well, um, like every other teenager or early 20-year-old, they became, uh, well, how can I put this, DTF, or the 1930s version, down to frolic, as they themselves stated, 
At 18, and with the world at our feet, we had never had a date, never held hands with a man or been kissed. In the wings of the theaters, across footlights, men looked at us, not as unusual performers, but in the way they look at girls they long to know. Romantic interest had overcome the scientific lure. Charm was in the air. We sensed it. And naturally, we fretted because our guardians herded us into the dressing rooms and back to our hotel. A bit wordier than DTF, but pretty much the same thing. But it wasn't to be. There was no way Meyer Myers was going to allow any of that kind of nonsense. Thank you very much. And although the girls flirted with various other performers, including a band leader named, no joke, Blue Steel, Myers or Edith were always there to throw any flowers that got sent their way into the garbage and stand guard at their dressing room door. But one admirer did manage to slip through the cracks, sort of. Bill Oliver was one of their booking agents and apparently both social and handsome. According to the sisters, any flirtation between them was entirely innocent. He was, after all, married. But one word set the next wheel of fate in motion. Bill had asked the girls to autograph a picture of themselves, and they did. To our pal Bill, with love and best wishes from your pals, Daisy and Violet Hilton. Unbelievably, that one word, love, was enough to spell scandal and potential ruin. Imagine the shame and fear they must have felt when the girls opened one of their smuggled-in newspapers on Sunday, December 14, 1930, and encountered a banner headline announcing that Mildred Oliver says her husband fell in love with both Siamese twins. Mrs. Oliver was suing her husband for divorce and the twins for $250,000. Exhibit B was the very autograph that Violet and Daisy had signed for Bill. In the lawsuit, Mrs. Oliver stated that the defendant, Bill, admitted his relations with the Siamese twins, telling her that the twins were jealous of him and jealous of each other and the affections of the defendant, and even though, and in spite of their physical condition, sometimes would not speak to one another for a period of several weeks over the defendant's affections. Bill said that he was not in love with either of the twins, but they were a good meal check for him, buying him expensive clothing, jewelry, and showering him with gifts of various nature. When Meyer Myers came raging into their room with the paper in his hand, the girls vigorously denied the accusations. Meyer Myers decided that this apparent libel must be answered before it destroyed their reputation, and drove with them to meet San Antonio lawyer Martin J. Arnold to discuss fighting the lawsuit. As Meyer Myers explained the situation, with plenty of ranting, naturally, the attorney noticed something odd in the demeanor of the twins. Most people who saw them only viewed them as oddities, the peculiarity of their bodies distracting from the human beings they were, but Arnold saw two girls who were in trouble. Interrupting Myers, he asked to speak to Violet and Daisy alone. Myers reluctantly left the room and closed the door behind him. Arnold then asked the girls first about the Bill Oliver accusation, and then, after they denied that there was any merit to the case, he changed the subject to their well-being. You are two very frightened girls, he said. Isn't there something else wrong? Do you want to tell me? It was a watershed moment, and perhaps the most important question anyone had asked them in their entire lives. For a moment, they must have paused, uncertain of how to proceed, and then they started to talk. They talked about their lives as de facto slaves, about their loneliness, about their desire to live lives like other women their own age and escape the cruel abuse of Meyer Myers and Edith Hilton. They paced across the floor as they spoke, and they spoke for 45 minutes without interruption. At the end of their monologues, Martin Arnold agreed to represent them for free and fight against Meyer Myers for their emancipation. Of course, this had to remain a secret for now. If Myers caught wind of what the girls had told Arnold, he would surely spirit them away and punish them severely, if not send them to the dreaded institution. If they were going to make a real play at freedom, they would have to be careful. So, with Arnold, while Myers waited in the next room, they hurriedly concocted a plan. Afterwards, Arnold let Myers back into the room and continued to talk about the Bill Oliver case as though it had been the only subject he discussed with the twins. Now, just about the only time they were out of Myers or Edith's direct sight was when they were engaged in a music lesson, and this formed the hub of the plan they made with Arnold. 
When Myers dropped them off for their next lesson, they wasted no time and immediately phoned up Arnold's secretary, Lucille, letting her know that now was the time. Within minutes, Lucille had pulled up to the curb in a taxi. The girls came to the front door, gazed across to Lucille in the waiting cab, and hesitated for a moment on the threshold of freedom, scanning the area to make sure that Myers wasn't lurking somewhere nearby, ready to snatch them up, even as they made for the car. The coast was clear, and they raced across the front lawn and leaped into the cab, their hearts pounding. The secretary had the taxi take them to the St. Anthony Hotel and then escorted them upstairs to a suite. Where we found flowers, candy, a radio, magazines, and newspapers already provided for us. Girls, you're Mr. Arnold's guests. Order anything you like, said Lucille. Telephone friends, see if you can't enjoy yourselves. It was like a dream during the next few days while we waited for our trial to begin. For the first time, we could order something on a menu which we wanted. We had dresses sent up and selected no two alike and all the silly hats we wanted. We could dress and act our age and no longer be made up as children with bows in our hair. We got permanents and pinned up our hair. I, Violet, had always wanted to drink a cocktail. I, Daisy, wanted to smoke a cigarette. We did. They also had their first kiss. Is. The court case was exactly the kind of media um, circus that you might expect. It had it all. Two pretty girls kept in a sort of gothic confinement, the glitz and glamour of early 20th century vaudeville, Houdini. Reporters didn't confine their news gathering to the details of the case itself either, but peppered their stories with amazing true facts such as that the girls didn't necessarily like the same kind of food, and that they had to pay for separate tickets to attend movie showings almost like real people. But honestly, the evidence was pretty firmly stacked in favor of the girls. Meyer Myers and Edith shed plenty of crocodile tears, but the fact was that there was no reason they should have been kept in bondage and had their money they earned kept away from them. Finally, the judge dissolved the guardianship and ordered Meyer Myers to give the Hilton sisters $100,000 of the money they had earned over their lives and to never interact with them again. For the first time in their whole lives, they were on their own. Together. You know what I mean. And they relished it. They went to clubs and dinner parties. They danced and smoked and drank. They had boyfriends and friends and fiancés. They traveled the world and they were happy. Until... Well... Until... Until Violet tried to actually get married to a young band leader named Maurice Lambert. The couple applied for a marriage license in New York and were denied on the basis that Maurice Lambert would in fact be marrying two people. As the New York clerk put it, the very idea is quite immoral and indecent. Officials in Illinois and New Jersey agreed, as they did in 19 other states. The twins were confronted with the sad fact that love for them was always going to be considered outside the bounds of public decency. Strangely, Chang and Ang, the original Siamese twins, so-called because they were actually from a place called Siam, had encountered no such difficulty when they had gotten married to a pair of sisters nearly 100 years before, which presents an interesting double... an inconsistency, don't you think? The twins' lavish lifestyle quickly depleted their finances, and soon they were touring again in order to bring in an income. Unfortunately for them, by this time, the mid-30s, vaudeville's popularity was waning. Live entertainment was being crowded out by the movie houses, and even singing, dancing, musical conjoined twins were no longer the draw they had once been. With some hope for a career in the pictures, the Hiltons played a pair of conjoined twins, named Violet and Daisy, in Todd Browning's film Freaks. But the movie was a bomb and no other opportunities came their way. Back on the road, they continued to play smaller and smaller venues for less and less money and moved through the next two decades in increasingly dire financial straits. On several occasions, they staged fake weddings without any legal binding, of course, to draw on the press. And it worked for a while until the public realized that these marriages were sham ceremonies. During one of the events where Violet married very definitely gay actor James Moore, Daisy was visibly pregnant. When the baby was born, she gave it up for adoption, so 
there's a good chance that somebody out there is going to have a rather surprising 23andMe result one of these days. In 1952, as the twins entered their mid-40s, they made one last play for screen stardom with a vehicle called Chain for Life that dramatized many of their experiences, but with the twist that one of the women was a murderer. I want to be free. Now I know that the only way I can be happy is to be alone with a man I love. The kind that say they don't fall, fall the hardest of all. So never, never, no, never, never, never say you'll never fall in love. Murder. Murder that baffled justice. I watched this movie and uh, it wasn't good. The Hilton sisters, for all their musical ability, could not act. Yes, sir. We were such a happy family. The Gordons... Sardo, Del Rio, the Benedets, Ross and Kennedy, Whitey Roberts, Tony Lavello. The script is badly written, the murder scenario is ludicrous, and the film was dismissed at the time as a cheap cash grab, which it pretty much was. going to have a tough time making a decision in this case. If you don't believe me, you can watch it right here on YouTube. Go ahead. See how much of it you can endure. We are gathered in this company to witness the joining together of this man and this woman in holy matrimony. Into that state, these two persons have now come to be so joined. Unless anyone can show cause why you may not be so joined together, I will now proceed. By the authority vested in me as a justice of the peace. Do you, Andre Pariso, take this woman to your wedded wife to live together in lawful matrimony? Do you, Dorothy Hamilton, take this man to your lawful wedded husband to live together in lawful matrimony? Will you love him, comfort him, honor... It stinks! And that was really the last gasp of their high-profile life. In the later 1950s, they played burlesque stages, although it's not clear to me just how risque things got. Unfortunately, Meyer Myers was not the last manager to steal from them, and they were never particularly good at handling their own finances. So as they entered their 53rd year in 1961, their situation had become desperate. By that point, the movie Freaks was enjoying a revival among the countercultural, so... Even though they professed to be embarrassed of the movie, they would make guest appearances at drive-ins that were showing it or Chain for Life. They even moved to Charlotte, North Carolina to work closely with a costume shop owner named Philip Morris, who moonlighted as Dr. Evil on a television horror show. He helped them find some work in the area, but the opportunities were few and far between. Their last public appearance was at a drive-in theater in Monroe, North Carolina. Once again, their manager, not Philip Morris this time, but another man, stole their money and abandoned them after the show, not even leaving them with a way to get back to Charlotte. They prevailed upon a motel owner to let them stay for a while and try to find work. When that didn't pan out, the motel owner gave them enough money for bus fare back to Charlotte. They made a decision then. It was the early 60s. They were aging and they were broke. Show business seemed to be done with them, and frankly, they were done with show business. So they arrived in Charlotte and more or less immediately made their way over to a small grocery store, the Parkin shop, to ask for a job. They even offered to let the owner, Charles Reed, pay them a single salary. I went home that night and I thought about it quite a bit, Reed told Charlotte Magazine in 2008. I thought, well, what can I do with these two women? I wanted to help them, but... I wasn't quite sure what kind of job I could offer them. I didn't know how well my customers would take to the sight of the two of them together cleaning the floor or something. Finally, Reed decided to hire them as the two individuals they had always been. He even modified the counter they would work at so that a casual customer would notice nothing out of the ordinary about the two middle-aged women weighing and pricing produce. I think those were the happiest days in those girls' lives, just getting that little job, Reed remembered years later. 
And why not? They had been on top of the show business world, but horribly exploited. And they had spent years scraping out a living, trading on the novelty of their appearance, but they were robbed and mistreated and finally abandoned. Now, in Charlotte, they were given employment that did not hinge on the unusual nature of their shared bodies, and they had security to boot. Charles Reed helped them find a house when they had saved enough, and they joined classes at the local Methodist church. They refused interviews, and they declined to have their pictures in the paper. In other words, they were finally truly living on their own terms, and they had found a community that quickly became accustomed to their unusual appearance and grew to regard them as just people. And so it was for the next seven years of their lives. The last seven years of their lives. They made no more attempts to return to show business, but instead seemed quite content with their small town existences. In January of 1969, the now 61-year-old sisters faced one final ordeal together, the Hong Kong flu. It took their lives, and they died holding each other. Friends and co-workers attended their funeral, and they were buried in a plot donated by a member of the church. I'm not the first one to cover the Hilton sisters on YouTube. There are quite a few videos on them, in fact. But something about the way those videos are characterized rankles me, and that's the tendency to promote the twins as tragic or sad. And I know that's just a question of how we poor YouTubers have to vie for your attention and precious, precious views. In order to stand out, we have to try to sell the story in as few and punchy words as possible, preferably along the lines of tragic or insane or horrible or dark, in all caps, of course. I'm guilty of it too, but in this case, it really bugs me. These two women had sad and tragic and awful parts of their lives, but I don't think that we can sum up the totality of their existence with any of those adjectives. In fact, I would argue that their story is actually kind of the opposite. They were born into a world that approached them with fear and revulsion. They managed to rise to the top of their class and even gain liberation. True, their path was never a smooth one or a clear one, but they persevered every step of the way. At the end of their lives, where other storytellers may say that they died in obscurity and poverty, I say that the last few years of their lives were a triumph. They were finally accepted as the individuals they had always longed to be seen as, even in a society that 20 years before the Americans with Disabilities Act was rife with prejudice and under no legal obligation to accommodate them. Online culture, YouTube culture, American popular culture tends to view fame and wealth as the rewards of self-actualization, and failure to attain those things must therefore mean that your story is tragic. God, I hope not. And I like to consider the examples of Violet and Daisy as proof that that isn't so. They weren't the first conjoined twins, and they certainly weren't the last either, but the world has changed for the better in that people who are born with this condition are unlikely to be forced into a life of performance and servitude or denied the opportunity to find love and happiness, at least in the United States. People will always have a natural curiosity about unusual bodies, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But when we reduce people to those characteristics and refuse to allow them to actualize themselves beyond that, that's a dreadful sin. Fortunately, the world has become more accepting and given people born this way the space to live their lives as they see fit. In fact, social media offers up several examples of conjoined twins who have been able to follow their own path in life. Brittany and Abby Hensel teach elementary school, and you can learn more about them through a documentary that aired on TLC and is available here on YouTube. Carmen and Lupita Andrade have a channel documenting their lives, They've done a few Q&As about their situation, and they are honestly both hilarious, so you should definitely check them out. Thanks for watching. If you haven't already, like and subscribe below, and then check out my Patreon, patreon.com slash tybannerman. I've been fiddling with the tiers, and now for as low as $3 a month, you can join the Dreamland Sideshow. For more, you can get into some cool perks, t-shirts, etc., and more importantly, you'll help support this tiny little channel. Thank you for meeting me.